Hey man, do you have any idea what this play is about? I have no idea. So shut up, sit down, the curtain is about to go on. Good evening. You are about to experience Side A, Act 1, from the mind of the shaman. Okay, this is Jimmy Jive, and you're listening to Motor City Rock Talk. To say my guest is Mark Wolf, mastermind, guitar player, producer, uh, financier of Shaman's Map. He's going to talk about his influences, where the band started, how it started, and the different members. All right, Mark, how you doing today? Good. Give me the lowdown. Well, basically, uh, you know, music's been a part of my life. Being born in 1960, the Beatles were my sister's favorite band, so anything new that came out was the Beatles. That was a given. We had got into the 70s and music was more hard rock it was getting better and uh I had a friend named Mickey that uh, I met in junior high, and he was in bands, and so I started just being a grunt roadie for him. Doug and bands. Mickey St. Clair, right? Yes, Mickey St. Clair. Uh, these are high school type bands, and did some park shows, played uh, the high school kind of thing, and um, there was some good players. Uh, even David Black showed up in there um, at some point. And um, so I always wanted to play, and uh, one of my uh, ex-girlfriends sold me a Sears guitar and amp for 50 bucks in 76 and uh you know i started playing that uh kind of tripped out at a party one night and tore it to shreds bought another one and that stayed under the bed for a while so about 2021 i it just stayed under the bed and i didn't play so i it's kind of my influences were all deep purple pink floyd led zeppelin black sabbath i mean you mentioned mickey sinclair of course he's known for a lot of things but your big connection with him i think was starting with Seduce. How, what was your position or what, how, how did you connect with Seduce? Well, um, I was kind of there from the whole beginning of the thing and really I'm the actual first grunt roadie ever hired by Seduce. A lot of people think that, uh, oh man, Chico was the first one, but no, Chico was a good friend of the band and he did end up working with them, especially when they got bigger. But I was the first one they hired in because Michael was the road manager, Steven was the sound man and Kenny was the light guy and I was the grunt and you know I was Mickey's roadie because I'd been roading for him before and they also wanted me to you know be a little bit of a caretaker or look over Mickey the whole thing so I was there the night David and Mark came into a mirror child show and talked to Mickey I didn't get to sit in on that but I watched him walk through the audience and go back there and Mickey told me what was going on and uh, next thing I know is we're at a meeting at the 24 carat on Telegraph and Spark Sparks is playing, so Mickey's gonna sit in. I just remember when I walked in, Steven was playing Down to Earth by Rainbow, and that was like so cool at the time. Yeah, cool. And basically, they uh, they started rehearsing in the basement, and they were doing it with Mark Fennell, another one of Mickey's best friends and mine we all grew up with, and they worked up some songs, and they were still Spark. And now, did they, you said they worked up some songs, were they doing this kind of on the sly, you know, with the, with uh, the yeah, other Yeah, yeah, totally really um in fact the night that they asked mark he could come up and sit in at blondie's you know gwen said that it was cool second set i believe opening and they did like i don't know and rothschild and i i don't know mark's sitting on the end of the stage singing i don't know like you know like he's done it a thousand times and you know i'm backstage after that set and she's like wow this guy's really good are you you guys are really good together and i'm like everybody had to just smirk and shut their mouth and right. sit there you know right. so that's the next thing Thing you know they were seduced it was new year's eve 1980 into 81 where they, where did played, they, play they played their first game, uh, they, remember? some giant um roller rink in wayne oh wow and the guy and the promoter ripped off all the money about i don't know 11 or so 12 o'clock and they seduced they didn't have to play but they, they played it was probably one two in the morning they did four or five songs they came out and just said we're gonna do this for our fans because you know we prepared for this but there's no money so yeah i didn't i started working for them uh it was 81 but right. you know how and I, did you live at the seduce house were you actually uh uh a yeah tenant? Uh, yeah i did how was, I, how I was quit, that a well quit my job as a manager i got separated from my wife at the time uh in there and uh we lived like a rock band you know there wasn't much money there were high times and low times sex drugs and rock and roll i mean that's what they did 24 hours a day i don't know they, was anybody in the band there wasn't working much at all other day jobs 
at all? Yeah, at the time, I think Mike was working a job and bringing in some money. I don't know if anybody else was. The band brought in some money. They kept the whole thing going. They right. paid for the house. They paid the bills. And, you know, we got to eat occasionally. The, the, <laughs> the, the, the groupies really pitched in because they bring in great meals. But Did they, they rehearse there right in the house, oh, too? Oh, yeah, hell yeah. That's got to see them play constantly. You know, I, I could sit on the stairs. Nobody, the other people couldn't do that then. I could sit, like, down on the stairs so I could make eye contact. And no matter who was auditioning, they wouldn't ever throw me out or do anything. And then did they, did they have a sound man doing sound there? Yeah, the yeah, Stephen. You know, oh. Stephen went on to do sound at the Premier Center. He, he did a lot of things. Worked sound for Aretha Franklin there. Yeah. Okay. Well, let's move a little bit forward and stuff, because I'm sure you'd have, you probably have a lot of stories you can yeah. tell about what happened in that house in the instance. Mickey leaves Seduce. What do you know about that, or what do you? What's your insight on that, or your opinion on that? Well, I was there that day. Um, I watched your interview or listened to your, your interview with Chuck. I'd have to say Chuck pretty much got it spot on because I think they told me the same thing they told him. They probably told me after him, but David took me in the room by myself, and you know he said Mickey's going. We want you to stay on if you can. And I was alone with him, and I said I can't do that. I mean, I helped him move out that day, you know. So, but you know, and Chuck was right because. He was friends and part of the whole thing too. So I mean, I, I don't know. It's just so you it just was. didn't backstabbing Mickey if you yeah. hung out with them. Yeah, I mean, basically, I've been following Mickey around with every musical adventure he'd been on since we were 15 years old, something like that. That's some strong I mean, loyalty. I mean, he he's he's undoubtedly one of the best drivers that ever's been in Detroit. Oh, that's absolutely. for sure. So you know, that's just where my loyalty was. Okay. Well, I had enough said on that. Unless there's any Anything more you want to add to that? No, that's that's good because I will tell you this. I learned everything that I did in Shaman's Mask from working with Seduce because I didn't just be the roadie. I ended up sitting in next to Steven doing everything and Kenny unwiding everything and running lights and just I learned how to work a band and I learned how to put on a show and I learned how to judge sound. So they would send me to the back of the room to sound check it, you know, and I'd have to go back there and you know if it was good and I was good that's what they went with so I've learned actually a tremendous amount I, I probably I don't know that the reason I could be in a band and run a band was because of that, that experience okay other than uh, that time with Seduce being their head roadie and learning all those different aspects of the business so to speak did you were you at all playing with anybody else at that time or is it was Shaman Smash pretty much the beginning of your musical performing journey yeah. it's just sad. okay I I I didn't play for, for a long, long time. I was a restaurant manager for a long time. My father was into that. Worked at Harmony House with you yeah. for, for a long time. Mm -hmm. So when I left Harmony House, I had a, a good friend there named Larry Tanner, and he left about six months or so before me. And, you know, we were always in contact, in concerts together and everything. Um, Trait was one of our group, too, good friend, also a Harmony House person. Basically, Larry kept telling me, he's like, I'm, what are you doing since you quit? He's like, well, I bought a baby and I bought some equipment and he goes I started playing I at that time he really never played before and he's like he goes get a guitar and start playing so this goes on about six months or so and I told I'm talking to Paul he doesn't live here then he was moving all over the country with his family I uh, said you know Larry's wanting me to play something and Paul's like I got a guitar I'm gonna send it pay me when you get the money so next thing I know I get this uh, sunburst fender strat and a, wow. and a case shows up at my house you know, the day it came, me and Larry, we went down to Marshall Music in Wyandotte, or wherever that is, Lincoln Park, and bought a little Marshall amp, a couple of effects, and that was it. We came home, and we sat on the floor, and Larry just started wanking away. So when I was playing earlier, when I was younger, Mickey taught me riffs to, you know, songs everybody knew then. Smoke on the Water, Bridge right. of Size, Third right. Stone from the Sun. Well, after all that time, because I'm like, mm, what am I? I'm like 30 seven years old or something at this point. I started playing these things and Larry just looked at me like, wow, shit. Okay, and I'm like, let's go. <laughs> so, you know, he, he was the kind of guy that would jump on anything, just jam with it. So, if you could play a good portion of the riff, you could play something for 20, 30 minutes and just keep going. Right. And the next thing I know, I'm literally taking my guitar in front of the amp and mashing it and it's feeding back and I'm sliding it off and Larry's just looking at me like, what the hell's going on? So, 
that's how that started. They're mostly like long jams, just original stuff you guys were just, doing. Yeah, based off of the riffs that I knew. Oh, that's cool. You know, you got to get a visual picture because you'll see it in there. Larry is six foot nine and a half, a black, <laughs> a black gentleman, and I'm like a five foot five little white dwarf, and we were quite a pair together when people would see us. And Larry's father worked for Warner Brothers. He was a record rep, and you know, Larry would get things like, and I mean, Larry was into like. Um, first generation deep purple um, mark one cream cream pink floyd and he had white label promo records from all sorts of things his dad gave him his father father passed away I believe it was uh new year's eve either new year's eve or christmas or story but yeah so larry was uh he was quite the thing because he was into old school hard rock psychedelic music and he played that way a, a brown sg bass like um you know like jack bruce from cream and right. they played an 800 watt Ampeg stack with an 18 bottom <laughs> that literally broke the you know lights in my kitchen upstairs and shut the walls and knocked pictures off <laughs> and that's for real. So he was overpowering you? Well, he tried. We were we we had a war for a good part of a year or two, two, three. We we went to war with each other. So <laughs> that's all. You know. Were you using many effects at that time, or you had gotten yeah, into that always, much? Yeah, always. Always. Yeah. Always. Too much, but yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, they just kept getting bigger and bigger. Right. You know, all along. How long how long did you play with Larry before Paul came? Well, me and Larry started in ninety seven. Paul, yeah. Man, he probably started in about ninety nine. He may have stepped in for a second in ninety eight. Believe it or not, even Mickey stepped in there for a second too, but it wasn't ready for him. So so yeah, it was probably around ninety eight, ninety nine that Paul came in. And it was just the three of you when did you get a drum? Or how did you split up by the van? Well, yeah, it was just the three of us to start with, but right. my uh, my sister's, Amy's ex-boyfriend, Dave Guzik, was a drummer, so was his brother. His brother played in Who Tribute bands, and they played it, uh, man, out there, whatever, they played a bunch of big shows as a Who Tribute band. They were both good drummers. I just called him up out of the blue, and we, blew, we kept in touch with each other all along. Uh, he came over, and we just jammed. Actually, Paul probably was just in and out at that point. Paul wouldn't commit he wasn't committing to nothing at that point he was just kind of coming and going you know he helped give guidance and kind of a thing when dave came in it was me larry and dave and it was pretty much a instrumental psychedelic jam band so we kind of magnified all that stuff loud. very 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 loud, very loud. <laughs> and we all shared a lot of the same influences in prog music and, and mostly prog and, ha and hard rock yeah first show is a three-piece at the record club in uh How did that, go? that went really good it would. I wish I had a copy of it. I know somebody has it. Oh, really? Yeah. You know somebody has it? You've never seen it? Yeah, Who's never that? heard it. Uh, one of my ex-managers from Harmony House. Oh, <laughs> and where was yeah. this at? The record collector in Redford there, Grand River and Eight Mile. Oh, yeah, yeah. 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 How did you get that? You know? Well, Larry worked, um, he worked part-time for Warren that owned the record collector. He also worked uh, for a guy over in Royal Oak at a music store, Gordy. And Larry's main job was a tree cutter for the city of Detroit and when he, when he worked for Harmony House he was only part time there too so he just kept himself involved with music and kept his regular job all the time hmm. now uh, were you nervous playing that show being, being probably the first show even though it was all instrumental how much control did you have were you happy with it from what you remember <laughs> yeah actually from what I remember that show I think it went down really well and I think my friends liked it but it was just really Neanderthal you know it was just jamming really really hard jam and really loud oh, that's but cool. i mean it'd be nice to have to hear it because everything else at least i've got to look back at it so all right from there i imagine then paul, paul came comes to the yep. thing full time so how long were was the lineup you paul larry and what dave. was it and dave how long did that go on oh geez approximately well about a year because uh basically there there was about a year anyway, larry he, he quit larry just uh at the time he had retired from the city of Detroit and he was a cameraman for ESPN and he was like 
like running up and down the field with giant cameras at the U of M football games and stuff, and he's traveling around the country. And when he, when Paul came in, it started getting serious. I mean, we knew that we were going to do that, and Larry couldn't commit. And when it started getting that heavy, he just said, I can't commit to this. So he left, and we're like, okay, what do we do? We auditioned some bass players, and we got uh, a guy named Rich in. I don't know his last name. I have it in my book. Um, and he played in the band for six, eight months. We did a show in the basement, mostly covers. The few originals were instrumental. And, um, you know, basically, um, we started discussing having you come in the band now what, what, and play bass. What covers would you have been doing at that time? Oh, man. He's you mentioned Smoke yeah, on the Water. Ro yeah, ro uh, Roadhouse Blues. Smoke on the Water, Hey Joe, Stranglehold. And who was singing? You? Were you singing these? Yeah, at that okay. point. I, I made the transition from singing because um, me and Larry and Dave, we tried singers when Paul came in. We tried having singers. We auditioned singers. That was the biggest night. <laughs> when we had phone, when we had when we had tapes for phone messages, I had 55 calls from singers. People that were said they were with Seeger, they were this, that. One guy left, he, he, he took my whole tape and then he called back again so we we, we, we settled on this guy named Horst I believe Horst and which is weird because Ian's favorite guitar player is that name anyways he wrote he came in and he started singing over the songs but he was singing through this old guitar effects pedal big giant Neanderthal one and uh, he sounded kind of like Trent Reznor wow. it was kind of singer he was and he would right. turn this stuff on and he would do it song from Lisa was actually born out of that um, we tried for a couple months with him and we just couldn't get there but with him singing it was like all right i ended up singing by default I, I i was trying to guide him through the songs we were doing to the point where i was doing them too and um i took song for lisa and i took some of what he had and i wrote the whole song and that's where i started and i just figured i'm singer by default i'll do whatever i can the best i can and somewhere down the road somebody will help me sing paul did sing with me i mean he did contribute then so backups anyway right so what happened to that guy? He just, after a couple of months, we had to let him go. Is it just too, the sound just wasn't meshing with yeah, what we you couldn't get, we, Yeah, we couldn't. We couldn't get the vibe with him. We couldn't button heads together. Mm. I don't ever, I don't know what happened to him after that. Okay, well, I remember when you contacted me, Mickey was playing with you at the time, or maybe he just started, I don't know. So when I came in, Mickey was out. Yeah, the whole thing was to try to put you and Mickey and the whole thing together. Right, but what I happened think. to the drummer that made you get Mickey? Uh, Dave, Dave just he left. He just quit. They, another thing. Look, the people around me were starting to see that this was going to be serious and we're going to do this for a while. And it was going to be like, yeah, we're going to rehearse. This is going to be regular. This is the deal. Well, sometimes people can't commit to that when they have other things in their life. Right. And it's one thing when they were younger or whatever, and then they find out that this is really serious. And uh, funny, we even asked my wife to play keyboards, which she would have been capable of, but how does she have a job and do that too? <laughs> so, you know, that's, that's why. So Dave was out. So, you know, Mickey was doing something at the time, and, you know, in order to have Mickey, we had to have somebody that could play bass, too. We had to have somebody like you in order to, you know, offer the whole thing up. So at this point, it's just kind of me and Paul talking about it, you know. Mickey was in on the conversation. He was there, and, you know, that's kind of how we approached you. And you were managing that Harmony House. He was somebody, because of the news thing, and just uh, knowing who he was to you, yeah. that kind of was a bit in Dating well, it was for me too. I mean, now I'm, you know, I basically work for him, and now he's, you know, down in my band with me. Yeah, believe me, it, it was a mind fuck for me too. I mean, the problem the person I was probably the least worried about it was Paul Trait, because Paul can play blind anything, yeah. you know? Yeah, he could he, blindfold himself and play it, so. Yeah, well, he I mean, was a closet he, Yeah, he was. And, and, you know, he got out there in the public, and we helped drag him out. Right. I know I did, so. Yeah. Um, well, but, he, did, he, did he play in any? bands before that yeah paul's played when he's in chicago you know he's played in bands and he's played in clubs out here and there that wasn't as really his thing you know right. it, it wasn't so you know that's that's okay he's one of the best guitar players yeah. that i've that i've basically ever known you know just getting the basics down when i really wanted to learn how to play and really wanted to learn how to learn chords and follow things and go with a band paul laid it all out with me he spent time with he was
was my teacher and I was taking guitar court courses at the same time. And this is after I'd gone through the jam phase with Larry. Right. I mean, I just like, okay, let's get real about this. You know, if you're going to be in a band, you got to know when shit's coming and when to change and go with it. So that's what I did. I, I, I owe all of that and more to Paul. Yeah, and you were, you know, not just playing guitars, you were going, you were stepping yeah, in I was on a, keyboards. I, well, I was a lot stuff. of keyboards then. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah, but you were doing both and you were yeah. doing pretty much, you were doing all the lead vocals. Yeah. We chimed in, I chimed in probably more than Paul at that time, yeah. which was fine. He had enough to deal with. And I remember he didn't use anywhere near, well, maybe at one time he did, as many effects pedals as you did. Well, he didn't use the pedals, but Paul had rack mount stuff. Right. He, he didn't go quite over the edges, me, probably he had anything that he wanted. Paul has a sound. Yeah, that's Paul, what I was Paul has say. a sound. I mean, uh, in all honesty, Paul's sound is somewhere between uh, Eddie Van Halen and Richie Blackmore at times and David Gilmore. He's got I all of that Gilmore. in there. Yeah, but his whole rig is based around Eddie Van Halen's, you know, JCM 800, and it has that growl. And he, he's he's a chameleon. He can, right. he can you know, if, if you want to nail it, and though when you put him in an original song, he won't just copy somebody. He'll play his own thing, but yet you'll hear well, yeah, the sounds that he has. Sure. Yeah. Natural with anybody. Get well, some better that. than others. Well, obviously. <laughs> mine, mine reminds me more of Sid Barrett than anything when I start solo and I feel like I'm like, you know, losing my mind a bit too. <laughs> well, you, you're, you're, you were always a rhythm player for the most part. Yeah. And then when you started playing some solos, they were very primeval. Yeah. And that yeah. was cool because it lent itself to the music. Yeah. That's what yeah. we, it's not like we were trying to write Rush songs. No. Or, no. or, or Yes or yeah. something. It was stuff that. But that speed was, was to. speed was part of the, part of the formula that kept getting faster and faster well, yeah, and faster yeah, as yeah. things went on. And I remember yeah. many of rehearsal and uh, stuff where uh, you had a little date yeah. and everything came moving a little forward. So anyway, Shaman's Mask is, is pretty much stabilized with Mickey at this point and we, we want to do an album. We want to record an album. We had enough original material at least for a, one side for songs that you wrote. You sang lead on and I backed you up on backup vocals and all that. And we did them at your house in the basement with a mall mall unit. What are your memories of that? Well, that was one of the longest days of my <laughs> life. I think it was like 16 or 18 hours. Um, we decided to do it mobile. One of my nephew's friends had a studio in Ipsy, kind of a basement studio, and he brought in uh, all his equipment and we had to wire it. We, we had something like, this is no lie, I think we had a thousand feet Man. of cables it sure seemed run like it. in that basement. And we had cubicles set up and everything and suctioned off. So we worked like that. We started the day and we partied the whole time and well, you, you we guys, worked the whole time. You guys yeah. worked. I pretty much got in the way and, and I had my little uh, adventure. The video camera. Yeah. I started interviewing you. I don't remember about what. All I know is I would put it nicely big and, and that got out of control. And then I was still saying with, with Mickey and with Paul and I came to realize I was irritating you guys that you were really trying to We were working. Stuff. Yeah. You were we working. Were, we were I, working. I had no technical yeah, skills. Yeah, as yeah. Far well, as that's, that. yeah, we got used to you saying that. <laughs> so, you know, I could plug in the guitar and the bass and do my yeah, bit, yeah, but yeah. other than that, you don't want me plugging in chords. Yeah, yeah. So I left the night, did my thing that, you know. There's a whole tape of all that interview stuff, um, and it probably figures that you're doing this because, you know, that's what you did that day was interview everything from the neighbors to the band to the toilet. So, um, I, whatever. Um, it is what it is. We, we did, we recorded everything we wanted, we set out to. Several takes, it got really late into the night. We were really tired. We yeah. Were really bent. Most of it came out, you you know, usable. It, it, when I listen to it back now, I think the sound of that album is better than the second one overall, but, um, and I had the choice to do this. I was given the opportunity to bump the tempo of the whole thing up a little bit. I may have, because you can hear the tiredness in it, but that's okay. Pink Floyd plays really slow, and, you know, that was part of the point of it, but we were really slow. <laughs> we, we were wiped out is what we were when we recorded it, but it became, it was really 
really warm. It was a warm recording, and you know, you could just, you could tell that by the whole thing. And there weren't very many overdubs, as far as I mm. remember. You went and did, did the vocals and whatnot, I think, at obviously a later Not game. a lot. We laid some solo stuff yeah. over it, some vocals, and then we put in the sound splicing right. for the, the, you know, the pieces of it to just tie it together. Right. Yeah. And all that. But I, I, I totally agree. I think it's a very warm, ambient album. And as for being too slow, I think that's just the way we played in the basement well, because, you know, maybe I think it, it was that nice. <laughs> maybe it needed to be faster in places, which I think it was on the other cover side. Songs, yeah. On the yeah, other side. Yeah, but yeah. that wasn't what the band was talking no. about, in my mind, anyway. It was about right. that whole spacey kind, kind of that, Pink Floyd yeah, thing. That totally was, that Pink was Floyd. the whole Pink Floyd thing. Because the whole Pink Floyd thing goes back to me and Larry. I, I will make one thing that I want to say about how I came up, not how, how me and Larry came up with the name of this band. Okay, that has to be. So, we originally were gonna call ourselves the Final Solution. Warren that owned the record collector and he had a couple of them then. He was in Royal Oak. He's like, we were getting ready to do a show and he's like, uh, he's like, I can't book because of the name. And we were doing it because of the Pink Floyd thing. Right. So we're like, good, that's how. So, you know, I went to St. Louis and I bought a candle, <laughs> purple mushroom candle. Larry wanted to call it purple mushroom. I'm like, no, 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 because, you know, I love the purple and whatever. I made this tape that had all these like crazy songs on it, you know, like Arthur Brown and, and War and Deep Purple and just, and so I have these series of books that are all about the occult, UFOs and all these crazy things and I told Larry, it's like two in the morning, he's at home and I'm I'm at my house and I get him and I said I'm going to start flipping through this book. So for an hour I'm flipping through this book. I got several of them. I said when I hit on something you stop me. Flipped it over and the chapter was called Shaman's mask because that's what the whole chapter was about he said that's it i said that's it i said but not mask just shaman's mask that was it and that's how we came up and and there's a whole chapter of those masks like you put out there right. to show the band that are in this whole chapter of this book and that's how that name came about so there wasn't a deeper meaning it was kind of fell by luck that was it we needed to play out warren was gonna book us we couldn't be offensive and well, we needed something that fit us now explain to people that might be younger listening why Final Solution would have been controversial. Well, you know, that's a statement from Hitler in World War II against the Jewish people. And Correct. Yeah. It, it's not right. We didn't mean it that way. Right, obviously. But, you know, and I don't know if you're watching, but, you know, in Germany right now, they're trying to sue Roger Waters for the outfit he wore at the show that he did uh, a couple weeks ago because he's wearing a Nazi-type outfit that was, you know, related to Hitler and the whole thing then. Right. And that's Roger Waters from, you know, Pink Floyd right. right now. But, you know, we just, we were just, it's a cool name, yeah. but there's too much attached to it. Right. There's to, and, and, and the thing was, the guy we were dealing with was a Jewish guy. Well, yeah. and, and Warren, he, and, you know, and it's like, okay, and he's in Royal Oak. And I he's going to know like, exactly what that means. Oh, you know, they knew right, right from the beginning. Anyways, that's a side note. We dealt with that. Shaman's Mask has been great. I mean, it, th that term has fit so many things in my life since we did it. Okay, so, you know, the album comes out. I think it's pretty wrong for all the reasons we mentioned. Now it comes time for doing the artwork, and I know Mickey did a lot of it, and we ended up, what, doing mostly the stapling and putting the papers to... Yeah, we put the, all the CDs together ourselves. Yeah. Mickey did the artwork. Um, I have the original stuff, quality drawings. Right. Yeah, we put it all together. We worked our butts off. It was hard back then to not a lot of places, you know, did that and if you did, you had to pay for it, and we were saving money. Right. You know, looking back, the stuff don't last as long when you do that, but, you know, we were doing it together as a band, so it was kind of fun, but, I mean, we were doing it like we were on a factory line or yeah. something, you know, <laughs> trying to put those other things together. Unfortunately, the, the, the covers that were on the CDs, you know, when you laid them over them, years later, they, they didn't play, because they weren't actually burnt into the disc itself. Yeah, they so, used those back yeah. things. But it's out there online, so right, people right. can get it right so time comes to finally get the hell out of dodge so to speak and play a play an actual show we've rehearsed gotten the cd out gonna do a hall show and it was a big ordeal from what i remember we had pages to set up you had a light guy all this major stuff a script a two scripts there was two scripts yeah for the a shows. lighting script and a sound script and bringing <laughs> everything practically from the basement and more to the hall and more become to look natural and all that 
I remember a big crowd. It was a good night. Everything sounded great. What happened? What happened? Well, you know, we played. Um, there's no way to, you know, cope this. Mickey and I are best friends and have been for a long time. You know, we all have our problems with drugs and alcohol. You know, the show started off strong and there was one of Mickey's friends giving him booze from the audience and uh, we got into this whole solo part of the whole thing and it just went really bad. It, it went really bad. Mickey got, he got way too drunk and uh, it, it just, it didn't end well. There's right. video of it out there and, right. you know, parts of the show were great. Yeah. Like you said, yeah. you know, there, there was sound and it was recorded and everything good and people were there. We did a charity for a mom's organization and all that. But, yeah, the tonality um, sound was phenomenal. Yeah, the, you know, I, I, there's not much else I can say about that. I mean, Mickey no. and I, we had a falling out after that, but and we were able to get by it and right. we were able to fix everything and uh, Mickey don't drink anymore at well, all. That's good, and, you know, and, and it's a lesson learned for us all. And even when he was still was drinking, we still fixed everything and got everything right. Right. I mean, you know, that was just a, uh, it was a bad night. He had so much on his plate and he was going to ask his girlfriend to marry him and it was just too much. Right. It was too much. And, and, and getting fed, you know, free liquor like that. Right. So, yeah, it was a big disappointment. It was, to me, it was to the band. Um, it's funny. I've had people tell me from the other side that it was a great rock and roll show. Yeah. Yeah. Funny kind of rock and roll show, but I mean, there's parts that I, I, I won't go to. And, and, and looking in retrospect, that's true, but the, the bigger issue here was that it was so unexpected because we worked so hard it was. on choreographing it, and having this it way, was. this set, this, yeah. you know. It was down. It was we we had everything, shocking. we had everything worked. We had we had so many things worked out down to the wire. And, you know, when you do that, fine, party a little or do your own thing, but you've got to really be at yourself and you got to be able to up with everything. Everything. And I'm not just talking about being able to play an instrument. I'm talking about timing and cutting in and out. Because every show we ever did, we didn't just put on shows where we played like a cover band. Never did that. Everything had a script that went with it. Right. So everybody had to know where they were at. Right. If we played a five-minute song or a 20-minute song coming in and out, all, everything had something going on. You right. Know? And then you so, tied it with the lights and whatnot. Sure. Yeah. So that, you know, that didn't, it, it didn't, the next day was bad. The next day, the band wasn't happy. The band was upset and then they were they had family there they had friends there and so it went down like that right. and, and that got and that got between me and mickey for for a long time we uh we came over that and we got beyond all that and uh it, you know mickey had an accident he got run over you know by a car on his bike and he can still play drums better than most people i oh. know and he's got 25 pounds of fucking metal in him yeah so sure. yeah i don't you know we wrote a song once called road to life and mickey mm -hmm. drew a a drawing that's on my wall in there but well, is the road to life right. and in the fence there's a there's a break in it and Mickey always told me that was that one time there was a break in it and how we fixed it and we went on well that's so. the most important anyway the band evolves again it moves on hope to do Paul steps aside for personal reasons or whatever you bring in your nephew Josh we obviously get a new drummer Kenny Kenny yeah. Kenny and stuff and continue on how did how did how did you take that out what'd you think of that as far as I line up. I like that lineup. Kenny played with uh, one of the orchestras down at the Masonic. Kenny was a very prog. Oh, yeah. Um, and uh, I like that about him. Um, I actually thought that version of the band really pretty good. We did a show. Yeah. Uh, it was actually a more organized show than the one we tried to pull off before. Stormed like crazy. It flooded that night. Yeah. <laughs> People couldn't even get to the building. But yeah. the show overall was a lot better. That was, at that, that point, that that was good. It was kind of like we were still on the line of what we were trying to do. Tricks of the safe Shapeshift and we were online with it we were moving on we had some new material but it wasn't recorded and that show probably overall is one of the best shows it's out there but so we went on from there but as soon as we got settled into that again um kenny uh, Did the, was that show see i don't remember i was there but i don't remember was that ever video tape? yeah i think we had that audio. audio i don't yeah. remember seeing that. yeah i think we had both i uh, think there is because i don't I think, think we we didn't use the no same... i know there is no not the same people we didn't but... use the same same sound yeah. people i don't think you had yeah. that guy with all the lights it was a bit more scaled down wasn't it Am i remember no actually this one was a bit more scaled
scaled up. Oh, the lights? Yeah. Well, who was doing the sound? Um, I thought you pretty much just set it up and we just no, on the actually, fly. No, actually, I actually think your buddy Mark. Mark did the first show. No, I think I think that he allowed us to use some of his equipment both times. Yeah. His, his, his amp, his power, his preamps, and his speakers. And that. Right. I don't know if we ever had anybody dedicated out there to do We had oh, a sound man. Right. I mean, we had light men. We had light men to do that. Right. That, that, that show was bigger in reality than the other one. We just right. didn't get the turnout because of the weather. Right. So, yeah, and you can't do yeah. anything about the yeah. weather. Mitch. So basically, after that show happened, 9 11 happened. So I can remember 9 11 happened on a rehearsal night. And we didn't know if we were all going to be there or if we even felt like rehearsing. And uh, I can remember sitting in the backyard on the picnic table. All the planes, they just were stopping. And at one point, I mean, we started to play and we, like, we went up there. Everybody's smoking whatever they want, and the whole place went quiet. No planes, no nothing. And we came, we came down. We never really played that night. We sat and we talked. We did continue on that lineup a few months. We wrote a few songs. And Kenny one night, so you know that was 9/11. So by the time it started snowing and winter came, one night people were having trouble getting to rehearsals because of snow and Kenny was there with uh, me and me and I don't know uh, you weren't there you couldn't get there because of the snow and he just said this was his last rehearsal so he's just there with me and Paul actually it was yeah it was me and Josh it would have been so. was he uh, there again like that not ready to con- commit to it in the full thing or yeah, yeah that, was, that one was a real shocker that one is just like he was there rehearsing and he was gone that night he packed up and left he didn't give any no he he just said that he was done and he was done he, he they'd adopted a baby and i don't oh, know if he ever played again yeah and uh so i guess here we are my nephew josh is filling in for paul now and uh you're on base you weren't there the night and uh we need a drummer so here we go again final tap right I mean, we have so many drummers you know they can implode and so we auditioned and we got sam and sam came in sam was a great drummer he's a really great drummer technical prog and so things were still everything was progressing the sound and everything was starting to go the way the band was trying to go all along to get more progressive and just to keep growing and what we were doing adding it to it. it seemed like everybody we were adding was actually helping the player even changing you know i grew up on the richie blackmore school you know everybody's expendable you just got to keep filling it in and go on make it better so we decided to um to bring in another member and a gentleman named bruce called me i was in the middle of moving from one house to the other and he called me before I left the other house and then he called me when I got to the other house and he just kept pounding me and he's like uh he's like he can play bass and keyboards and you know we're all talking as a band can we do this and so okay um I had been wanting you to go on keyboards forever at right. least more keyboard right. you're, you're you're you were a keyboard player that's how you were trained right. uh, you are a great bass player but that was your second hand thing right. they, you can play guitar, you can play anything basically, but the keyboard players was your forte. That's what you were good at. And so we we're gonna get you more on keyboards, and Bruce was gonna play bass. Well, um, or vice versa, keyboards then bass. I think. And he starts playing keyboards, and he, you know, he does these opening things where he does all these great things in the beginning. But then when the song kicks in, we just we couldn't get there. So we stopped and we said, okay, you can play bass. And I'm like, Jimmy, jump over on keyboard off the top of my head, and Bruce jump on bass. And we whittled through that, and it was kind of rough. It was kind of a, it was kind of a, you know, rolling disaster. But we stopped, and we, at the end of the night, we talked, and we said, well, that was better that way than before. And Bruce was a great guy. He was so yeah. in tune with everything we liked and what we did. He just wanted and, to be and, part of it. And, and Bruce, he had as much equipment and everything as I did. We were like a meeting was like a bomb going off. And so basically, we started rehearsals like that. Bruce on bass you on keyboards and you know you would never ever you actually told me early on you wouldn't play keyboards full time you you literally laid that down to me in the beginning of the band because i knew you know i was the keyboard player but you were a real keyboard player but you wanted to play bass this was the dynamic we had so we did this for a couple months it was just grinding on i think it was grinding on everybody something wasn't right so i thought about it hard long myself me myself and i told you i wanted to have a meeting with just me you and bruce 
And I said, all right, I want to take over all the guitar roles. I don't want to play keyboards. I want Jimmy to play keyboards. I want Bruce to play play bass. And I want, you know, hey, Sam can be the drummer. Well, for some reason, I don't know. It was like, it didn't seem like people thought that Sam could be the drummer for that kind of a four-piece band at the time. I think he could have, but at that point, I was willing to do, I was willing to sec, I was willing to compromise everything to restructure this band, to really restructure it, and allowing me to just finally play guitar straight out, keyboard straight out. I, I wanted to make it more like the bands I really like. So, you know, you came up with, uh, you, Jimmy, you came up with it, you know, Mark, one of the guys we had auditioned, he almost got hired. He was down to the wire on a couple, like an audition or two ago. So he was an in the, in the pocket kind of drummer, small kit. We called him up, he came in, bam, it worked. We started taking all the same songs. Now we got full keyboards. We got keyboards up the wazoo. I'm able to do what I can on guitar and, and, and we got a sound. Bruce, he's kind of a space tripper, but right. we got something going. That's when we started working on the last out price. So some of those songs had been written by some couple previous generations going in, but we honed them all down with just the four of them. And that's how we started. Well, you pick, you piece a lot of that stuff together from like opening night or opening uh, warm-up up. jams. I just, said, yes. Oh, this is the song. This well, is. when we came in, nobody started. You never came in and rehearsed songs in my basement. Right. You came in and played. We, we based on what you were on the first half hour or 40 minutes, you yeah. could just jam with us. If you couldn't follow us, you, you might as well leave. Right. So, I mean, yes, in all sorts of, I mean, we made one song, Winter's Dream, where I literally sliced pieces of stuff that, that Jimmy and I did together into something that we actually turned into something we learned how to play. Right. This so, is what you're listening to, by the way. Yeah. So, I mean, that's just how it goes. Yeah, that came back, that came out of the Mickey Paul days and stuff. I remember yes. Stuff. Oh, yes. Just noodling around one yes. night, and you're like, yeah. Yes. Yeah, piece that together and it evolved into that which tripped me out because like I said it was it was never anything I thought of as that it was just an exercise for my fingers and I used that hey well this kind of works and structured us a little bit I, how many bands would probably say that I bet you could say that about YYZ about Rush I mean it yeah. sounds like you know I mean practice exercises that when people jam right. you know but yeah I, I, I get that I mean so I, I listen to all of the rehearsals back all and I just right. and I would cop little pieces of them and I could cut and paste anything well that's the day old days tapes or whatever and you know I'd wake up in the middle of the night with songs in my head and I'd have to get up and you know go downstairs and like get them down on paper or recording on like a four track so I'd have the idea how to put the whole thing together for the band the next time we got together you know and so I was actually using pieces of what everybody did in order to make songs and it worked out it yeah. worked out I mean other than the stuff that you wrote that you you know you had all worked out we just had to arrange it you know you knew what you wanted we just had to find a way to arrange you know whatever that's how most of those songs work they came straight out of now that was cool I wasn't used to doing things that was that way in the past that was just somebody writes a song they come out and say here it is this is how you play it you add your part to it and so on and it was typical for bands at that time this was done a little bit different so kudos to you sir for being able to take the time <laughs> to piece that together because well, I didn't have any time I I I worked with a lot of musicians that worked in bands and they're so regimented to doing just, you know, bar songs and things yeah. like that, that that's what they do. And it, you know, you got to kind of like free their mind up a little bit in order for it to, to let them get out there, you know, just grow their hair a little bit. And that, that's all. Put I mean, your hair down. Yeah. You used yeah. to always say that. Relax. Just go with yeah. I mean, not all of it did. <laughs> no, no. A lot of it was just a train wreck or a disaster, but you know, there's, there's you always find some beauty in chaos yeah you know that's how i felt and that's kind of what you know we did you know we the diamond we, uh, in the rough so to speak yeah we you know we were interviewed by jam rag yeah. um eric harbidian a good friend of yours yeah. um you know our album went the first album went to europe and they reviewed it they compared us to blue oyster cult yeah. which is weird for me but fine yeah i love blue oyster cult so i do see I. them a zillion times but that i I didn't quite get that. I mean, people, they throw out things like the Moody Blues yeah. or Pink Floyd or some Sabbath here or some Zeppelin or, yeah. I mean, overall, it, the trippiness was always Floyd. Right. Um, the, the whole thing with uh, the last album is, uh, you know, it, it just got really chaotic. The last the, the last album, 
of them. I, there was so many things going on, and but yeah. Anyways, uh, now we've got a new band. Things are gelling. Songs are coming together. Structure. It's time to record a new album. Yeah. This time we decide, or you decide, because you bankrolled all of it. You paid for everything. The bottom line is, you know, whatever. So we go into the studio, and I remember it was a Friday night. We loaded out. We would caravan over that place in Blizzard, and we literally had to shovel our way in. <laughs> yes. And set up that night. Yeah. Do a minor sound check. Elaborate on that. Well, that session. took like three or four vehicles to get everything there. Yeah. Yeah. And we'd work this out with the guy that owned the studio. And um, so, you know, I have issues, my health, my hearing. And so I wanted to be isolated off. And so he created this whole hallway for me where I was isolated from the band and they were set up in the, the main room to record. Everything else was the amps and everything were put away. Other than yours. Yeah, yours other than mine. Not. Mine was yeah. left live behind me. So we went into this thing. We laid it all out with the with Doug. He was the guy to own the studio. And um, you know, I, I think I think he bought into too much of what we were wanting to do too to make it more complicated or technical. And I think uh, you know, he started suggesting this and this and that when we got there that night as far as using his drum kit, how to mic things, and uh basically when they've got everything set up, I think he over mic everything. Especially Especially the drums. Most of the drums. Yes. Yeah. Everything else kind of came out clear where we could work with it on a track. So we go in there for this weekend. We move in there in this blizzard. Play our asses off. Come out of there thinking it's great. Paid for the basic, you know, tracks to get them down to work with is what we always do. And uh, next day after we're out of there, he calls me up and says, come down here. And I go down there by myself and then I bring uh, you and Bruce down there and we listen to this and I'm like there are so many problems with the drum track so many mics on it that wasn't his drum kit clicks everywhere and we start discussing how do we fix this and there wasn't you know we talked about other drummers he said because of the way we did it and the way we played it'd be really hard to bring somebody else in and do that you think that was true or do you think he was making it to make more money off you as far as time you were going to spend no I think in all honesty, he thought we should probably just redo it. Redo the whole session? Yeah, and I, in all honesty, I probably think I would have too, and I would only let him put three or four mics on those drums, and I'd have let Mark bring his own drums in. And that's probably, I would have took another go at it, and I'd have probably come in the room. Yeah, well, the other thing, of course, before that even came apparent, we went back in there and did overdubs, yeah. vocals, because well, uh, there were more uh, of that uh, happening. That the whole time that that was going on, I was having to work on the drums tracks out with myself individually all the time yeah. i mean it wasn't that they were played wrong it's just that there were so many mics and so many clicks and it was picking up too much everything yeah. and you know we couldn't get it out and, and, and it affected everything right. so you know it ended up being so pieced together i mean i learned a lot about pro tools yeah. <laughs> i mean you can cut anything out of anything and you can take a track a drum part from another track you know and put it in there yeah. and the next Pace. thing you know the next thing you're you're all good so did the best we could right. with that you know and the thing is is i always wanted to go in and re-record the album i know that things were moving really fast at that time for everybody me drugs alcohol everything that was going on and um, i would have loved to re i actually wanted to go back in and do like an ep and you talked about was, yeah was, my, you were having issues because i remember that saturday you were in an episode with back and yeah. you had to leave to go to the chiropractor and that left us there looking at each other going well what do we do yeah we and we pretty much just like we did our part, so to speak, until no, you could come back and all that. Yeah, I'm, I we know. didn't, to be honest with you, I remember looking at Bruce saying to Bruce, we may end up have to scrap this. What if Mark yeah. can't come back? I know. What if we can't complete this? <laughs> How much of this can we salvage? You know, because we were doing two, three tra uh, yeah. uh, versions of each song, and, we were, and it was all going down pretty smooth up to that point, you know. Yeah, no, I know, man. My my body was given out on me, and that yeah. was that was only the first of it. Right. That <laughs> was the beginning. It was really, really crazy. Well, it's been going on forever, but that kind of pressure and stress, you know, you go into those things, you don't sleep or nothing. You just go from the studio to home and... Yeah. 
yeah, back you're so, again, and you're so you're hyped up. Always by what gone, you're do. yeah. So yeah. Do you but, remember the name of the studio? I I, I mean, I remember. Uh, I remember where Mid- it was. Middle Earth. Middle Earth. Okay. Yeah. I was. Yeah, in Farmington, it's actually called the School of Rock. Right. And it teaches, I guess, like School of Rock. But yeah, I mean, I, it was great. I mean, we owned the place. We, took, did, we went and took it over. <laughs> how did you come? How did you find that place, or how did you decide on that? Uh, Doug. Doug was a patient from Dr. Perkins, my chiropractor. Oh. That's how I found that place. Because I remember one of the stories, I don't remember, maybe I got this wrong and you can clarify it, that Leonard Skinner actually recorded there and they took down a whole yeah. section of the wall just yeah. to get his yeah. piano in there yeah, and then yeah. rebuilt the wall and then they had to tear they, it down they had, Yeah, they had done one of those uh, later albums where they came in and done some work in there, um, <laughs> you know, when it, after a long time ago now, but, right. you know, this was after long after the band was big. They were not very big at the right. time. And yeah. yeah, they did. They were in there just before us when, when they did all that. Yeah, I mean, you know, it was an experience and a half, I'll say that. I spent another year in there trying to fix it and spent way too much money and uh, I had good enough musicians and even when I moved on, I did, that if I could have redone some of it, I'd have been a lot better off. I should have scrapped the very first recording and just moved on and really, but, but you know. You know, like you said, you, you know, do what trying you to do. salvage and do what yeah. you do, you know. I mean, but the yeah. songs the songs that were better than the songs on the first album, I mean, it was basically originals, and they were good, and we were, you know, we were writing songs together, and, you know, the songs had more structure, they were better. Odyssey may be one of the best songs we ever recorded. I, I have, you know, Odyssey song for Lisa, Set the Controls, but Set the Controls is better live, and my son, and there's better live versions of that out there <laughs> too, but, you know, you know, we did did, um, we did the song for 9/11. Yeah, it was actually that. that was actually a song that was a you know we do the I did the Neil Young thing where I stole my own song, just added a couple chords to it. But the 9/11 thing that I was talking about earlier, the night we were at a rehearsal with like three bands ago, and it all the guys by it rewrote all the lyrics to it. So then we went out and you know we we're trying to find sound bites from people from that day that it happened. And it was uh, at that day we knew our world changed. We it really did change for everybody. I mean, between the, the, the change of the 20th century and the 21st century, that changed music radically. You know, 9-11 was something that just uh, really hit people like hard. Every, so we did this song and again, you know, I was ripping off my own song, but then, you know, we kind of ripped off Rush and we kind of <laughs> we kind of just ripped off a little bit of everybody, but w- what we were saying in the song was how, what I was saying in the song is how about the situation. You know, that it was hard to take back then. Yeah, well, it brought people together and there was a lot of anger yeah. and all that. People ready to take up arms, yeah. almost like back in World War II where people were actually ready to take. I may not be physically able, but I'll well, go over we there had, We had more faster. people join the service then yeah. than we had had in the last, since Nam. Yeah. I mean, people went out and joined the service. I mean, they did. I mean, yeah. it was an extremely emotional thing, and that kind of what that song ended up all well, about. Well, well, I referenced the World War II because it was it was the first time since Pearl Harbor that we were attacked on our know. soil. Yeah. None of those other wars were we. No. We got involved with no. it. They literally attacked here yeah. and stuff, and, and they shut us down. Yeah. Like you we were talking about the planes, yet yeah, all air traffic was Gone. shut down I because know. they didn't know if there were more of them out there. I know, I know. And that changed the world. The neighbors came out of their houses and people, like you said, were real emotional yeah. about it. And, you know, you're trying to get back to the roots of the family, to what's really important in life yeah. instead of just, you know, fame and fortune, you know, yeah. our existence. No, I know. Thinking we were uh, untouchable. I know. Realizing that. that I know it was wild. Well, everybody just walked, people just walked outside of their houses it was like that scene in um, 4th of July, you know? Yeah. Where they were looking at the aliens. Everybody's just looking at the sky like, where is everything? It was yeah. all gone. But yeah, you know, so that experience with that album, um, yeah, it, it, it was tough. I can definitely see why the band was uh, concerned with my health at the time. It yeah. surely didn't get better, but, um, you know, we got through it and we managed to get it out. I did the best I can. I like I love the songs. I think a lot of the songs on it are really good. I wish I could go back in and record them a different way that's something i would say yeah well you know yeah hindsight is 20 yeah. to say no so anyway we stepped from that and stuff and there was a long uh, you know we had believe we had a cd release party right here at the house yeah in the basement yeah. and yeah. that went pretty darn good yeah and all that again another drummer yeah no after that yeah. we had already brought jason in. after eb kind
kind of became a victim yes. of the crisis uh, right. um, because it seemed like I think they felt like everybody blamed him about the drum thing and that um, and he had his own issues going on in his life so we had uh, brought Jason in. Jason was you know the last surviving member of right. Shaman's Mask. Yes. He's also ended up being one of my best friends forever after, you know, I met him. But, um, you know, Jason brought, he brought artwork with him. He brought playing. Jason was messed up, too, because he had just busted, like, his collarbone in a motorcycle accident. And he was used to playing, like, right. one-minute songs. And, yeah. and coming in here, it's like, well, we're playing this thing for 20 minutes. And it's like, he's dying, you know. Yeah. And he just keeps wanting to do more and more and more. But he could barely get through it, you know. His, his arm would be falling off. Yeah. So, yeah. Yeah, we brought him in and we were actually working on uh, new songs we we put the got the cd together a better version of it at least you know artistically we played that night basically the next day the band just imploded that was i don't know are you talking about with jason with you and jason and and well, me and bruce uh, it went on for quite a while though we were we were rehearsing at least six months or so because <laughs> on the funny lighter side of it like you said when you mentioned his shoulder and all that how would we start rehearsals where we just started jamming you would be checking the sound levels yeah. and all that bruce would start stuff on the bass i just start soloing over it and it would go on and on and on yeah. and then eventually you would jump in and, yeah. and it was like a ship yeah. taking off oh. because it would be so damn loud yeah. talk about you were talking about this earlier about the the volume wars yeah, yeah. between you and larry when you had that with bruce too oh, yeah yeah at that big yeah. time and yeah. i'm over there i'm like well i can't compete sound wise because <laughs> it's not designed to do this and in the meantime these songs are getting in the 30 20 20 30 minutes long and jason's over there dying yeah and i'm i remember saying how did we end those songs and then i remember jason would just get up and, and walk out he yeah. just put his drum set, sticks down get up and and leave the basement for a while to go get air or recover or something yeah, he was, and we'd yeah, still be playing yeah his yeah his shoulder was yeah, so bad him. it was so bad and yeah, I, I know. felt bad for him and all that yeah i know and i think a lot of that was funny because remember... we no we were really getting you know we we were it was really working with Jason at the time. Yes. It, it was. I, and there's a recording of the last show, and that just uh, after we played that show, we didn't play together again. Yeah. The four of us till we were with Ian. Yeah, that was. I a, did. Was I did play with Bruce and Jason for a while. Yeah. Uh, maybe a couple years. Jason and I with Bruce did that. Um, but after that, I don't know the whole. I don't know the whole recording thing. Everything constantly in my health issues and everything. Right. I just you know. I think after that show, I, I don't know. The band just seemed like they were burnt out. I mean, if I had to look back on it, the best thing, and, and there's a billion bands that'll say this, everybody should have just said, hey, let's go home and not see each other for six right. Let's just fuck away right. from each other. Because right. we had been living together for so yeah. long, and the, you know, the pressure of everything was just like, you know, and everybody's watching me collapse. You know, we kind of did do that in a way. Me and you, we played together again in a whole different thing yeah. so we were all dabbling in things but it was not it never came back together till it came to Ian graduating my son right and I remember we had a few rehearsals and I didn't know he had come that far in bass and all that I like him really well it was tight and we do another show well so it was my idea one of these crazy brainstorms I have to bring the band back together and play with Ian on bass so when Ian was 16 he I was gonna sell my Washburn bass I've, I put every instrument there is on the planet in front of my son and he's a computer wizard right and so he says I tell him that and he goes upstairs and he comes back down and he says dad can I have it you can have it if you go down there and take it and learn how to play it no lie he had it for six months and he came out of his bedroom and he knew how to play it and he was playing it so we're getting close to his graduation you know and I'm thinking again I'm trying to value I'm listening to him at the bottom of the stairs play with him. if I really ask but right. I'm thinking you know everybody Everybody knows everybody here and they've known Ian since he was you there know, before the, he was there yeah you wrote the song for Ian yeah, when yeah. he was like yeah what, in, in his mom's beller yeah. yeah so anyways um, when I finally concluded that I thought he could do it I started throwing the ideas out there to you 
guys and uh, everybody seemed to be kind of hip to it. Yeah. So coming into 2017, we started rehearsals in February 2017. The show was August 26th. He had his graduation in between and crashed and totaled my car like the day before his graduation <laughs> too, on top of it. Right. He goes, he buries crawling into his graduation. So we another big show where we're putting it on at a hall and uh, we get people that really like us there, give us an extra day. You know, I hire everybody I can to help me, his friends, everybody, pack up trucks, rent a truck, the whole basement there, get the lighting, everything. Um, and it's family mostly kind of thing. You right. know, it was about 60, 70 people kind of a thing in a hall. And we supplied all the food and beer and the munchies. And this place just loved, they like loved the band. Right. They gave us a whole extra day. Then they kind of opened their bar. God knows what was really spent there that right. night. But I'm sure they lost money on that deal. So, you know, pulled that show off with Ian. And to be honest with you, you know, that started this whole thing with me and he sat in with us three songs or so. That probably could have been the best version of the band ever. Because I think, you know, find the right people, try to create this sound I had in my head. And I think by the time I got there, though, I was just too spent. Right. I had done it, done it over and over again. And I didn't have Ian until I was older. So, you know. I knew you were always hoping to bring him under your wing. And I was. And have him, yeah. I didn't know if he would or not. And, right. you know, all of a sudden he just decides to do that. You know, now he plays an eight string guitar and, you know, he, he, he sounds pretty much like the whole band, just himself by himself on a sure. room. But that's that's how it goes. Yeah. And and I wouldn't trade, I don't think I'd trade any of it for now. Especially, you know, it's hard not being with everybody, especially when you have a band that has revolving members in it, it always ends something new, you know? Kind of that Richie Blackmore philosophy on right. music. And every different person brings a different perspective to what you do. Right. You know? How emotional was that you? Your son basically grew up with the band. Yeah. In that house and in this house and stuff, hearing it in the back, you know, in his mind, whether or not he was ever going to be a musician or whatever, right, right out of the chute for you to finally be able to come full circle. Or yeah. Like that. Well, that if you something. see the pictures and that for the video, you can see the interaction. Right. It's hard. It's hard to sing because I'd get lost, especially during my son. And, and I was uh, I was really shot. What do you went to nowadays? Well, my health me out of music. I still listen to it and live it, but can't play it anymore. Six surgeries in 14 months. Think I'll beat this one, but it, um, no, um, you know, I can just be into hot rod cars in the 70s and uh, kind of here. And that's awesome because it's like the whole term rock stars in their cars. You get to live, you know, whether you were ever a big, you were part of the scene, you had to do this stuff, and now you're in the cars and yeah. stuff. And, and so many, you know, Jeff Beck was like that. Oh, well, well, these every, guys. Oh, every rock star yeah. has cars. Yeah, you know, it's just, it was something that me and Ian, yeah, and, 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 now and they're going to do as the father's we, something. Yeah, we deal with the uh, MRT right. customizing shop here in Plymouth, Michigan, and Performance Tent, and Liver Noise Motorsports, and, you know, our cars are, they're, they're pretty really so, you know, that's what we can do that we can do together. I can't play much anymore. He can still play. I, you know, don't know whether he'll do a band or not or whatever. He, he's more like the kind of person that would do the YouTube thing, you sure. know, now. That by seems himself. to be the norm. And if it. he did, and I, I want him to keep going, and hopefully he will later in his life because he has the ability. You know, whatever he does, we do that. We do car shows now, and, you know, we both listen to music. We work on our cars, and that's what we do. Well, we're going to end this interview by saying, you know, best of luck. It's been a great adventure playing with. Thanks for being on the show. As I like to say, keep rocking. <laughs>